Let the people's hymn sound with the praise of Bacchus. Bind your streaming locks with the nodding ivy, and in your soft hands grasp the Nicene Thyrsus. Bright glory of the sky, come here to the prayers which your own illustrious Thebes, O Bacchus, offers to you with suppliant hands. Here, turn with favor your virginal face, with your star-bright countenance drive away the clouds, the grim threats of Erebus and greedy fate. To you it becomes to circle your locks with flowers of the springtime, you to cover your head with Tyrian purple, or your smooth brow to wreathe with the ivy's clustering berries. Now to fling loose your lawless, streaming locks, again to bind them in a knot close drawn, in such guise as when fearing your stepmother's wrath you did grow to manhood with false seeming limbs a pretended maiden with golden ringlets with saffron girdle binding your garments so thereafter this soft vesture has pleased you folds loose hanging and the long trailing mantle Seated in your golden chariot, your lions with long trappings covered, all the vast coast of the Orient you saw, both he who drinks of the Ganges and whoever breaks the ice of snowy Araxes. Oh, hi, hello, and welcome. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby, and I'm your host, Liv, the woman who just can't say no to the god of wine. The past few episodes of the podcast have been heavy, I think it's safe to say. I realize I don't present them as all that heavy, because I really fucking love Medea, and somehow that love allows me to overlook the fact that I'm talking about her killing her children on stage. <laughs> And no, I don't totally want to consider what that says about me. Instead, I'm going to lighten what wasn't quite so dark to begin with, with an episode featuring none other than everyone's favorite god of wine, partying, and god, so many other things. Our precious friend, Dionysus. Except, well, apparently I can't quite give up Seneca just yet, because that bit I read at the top of the episode was a little song for Dionysus from Seneca's Oedipus. Not only do I always want to talk about Dionysus because I am a sane person who recognizes the most fun god when she sees them, but I've also been reading a particular book. It's not coming out until May of next year, so you'll have to tide yourselves over for a while, but Crown of Starlight is a new novel by past guest of the show and friend of mine, Kate Corain, and, well, not only did Kate write a super queer and super sexy retelling of Ariadne and Dionysus featuring a non-binary Dionysus who literally changes genders on the page, but, well, it's also set in space. Like as if Greek mythology was also Star Wars. Yeah, you can pre-order it now if you want. Crown of Starlight, you're welcome. Anyway, uh, reading about this wonderful version of Dionysus just made me want to visit some of, you know, his lesser known stories or just like him in general. Uh, but frankly, when I read one of them, I laughed out loud so hard and then just immediately went looking for whatever could make up this episode. When you get there, you'll know it. Because, you know, sometimes um, I just I forget quite how wonderful the little bits and pieces of Dionysus really are. So that's what today's episode is for, because he's just such a fun god. And yeah, I um I just had to call him Daddy Dionysus. I'm not sorry about it. I'm only sorry that it had to come after that ex incredible rendering of Seneca's Medea, where Medea calls Jason Daddy in a, in a very, very different context. This is like... Pedro Pascal daddy that I'm talking about. That's that's the type of daddy that Dionysus is. This is 
episode 227. There's no one quite like Dionysus, wine daddy of Greek myth. Dionysus, Dionysus, Dionysus. Or Bacchus, Laius, Bromius, Zagreus, uh, even, <laughs> if you must. The man has about as many names as he has stories, which is more stories than can be said for the Olympians. And yet, when it comes to those stories, too many of them are brief, like little, little blips. Important origins or moments that were necessary to be told, and thus just lacked much in the way of, like, dense detail, the stuff we really like. Of course, that's not always true, but it's just, it is true for lots of his stories. So today, I just want to talk, like, all things Dionysus. Moments from his history, his origins, random children he might have with random women whose stories are brief and yet wildly entertaining. Epic wanderings, fits of madness, the time he had his aunt rip his cousin's head off his body. You know, just the usual for the god of wine and madness. All reasons why he's my favorite god, or one of them, at least. You all know I can't actually pick a favorite. And no, don't worry, I'm not going to try to retell Bacchae again. I just can't talk about Dionysus without talking about the time he had his aunt rip his cousin's head off. Now, I won't retell the entire story of Dionysus' conception. I've told it before, um, and it's frankly quite depressing. And I don't really feel like talking predatory men today, and that's why I've gone with Dionysus. So we will just gloss over how gross the actions of his father, Zeus, were in the conception of Dionysus. And instead, we'll just say that his mother was a lovely Theban princess, a mortal woman named Semele, who deserved better than she got. And his birth was. <laughs> well, it was weird and unfortunately gave Zeus ammunition to pretend Semele barely played a part in it. Still, without going into all those details, we've already got one of the most interesting parts of Dionysus. He's born of a mortal woman. He's the only Olympian god who is, technically speaking, half mortal. He's also the only Olympian god that marries a mortal woman, Ariadne, before having Zeus turn her into an immortal so that they could stay together. Not only is Dionysus unique as all hell when it comes to the rest of the major deities and Greek deities broadly, but he's like, he's kind of a romantic too. And these two supremely special aspects of him and so many more other little bits and pieces about his character and his role in mythology, they just make him seriously interesting even without adding in the fact that he's the god of wine and drunkenness. Dionysus is old and young. He is local and foreign. He is kind and beautiful and monstrous and horrible. He is protective and seriously dangerous. He plays with his gender. He has a fluidity that no one else has. Dionysus is everything all at once. One of the most important things to understand about Dionysus specifically is also one of the most helpful things to remember about Greek mythology broadly, and that is the sources we have, the stories we have, whether they are full or fragmentary, whether they are common and well-known or have stayed like niche and half forgotten, all of them span, and particularly when it comes to Dionysus, span at least a thousand years. And yet, often, these things are presented as a kind of generalized idea of the god. Like, this is Dionysus. He was born in Thebes, and then he was forced to wander the east where he shared the art of winemaking before returning to Thebes and tearing shit up, and eventually taking his place on Mount Olympus. Oh, and while, well, like, hundreds of other stories also happened within that time period, like, remember the time I told you the story about him being kidnapped by pirates? <laughs> How he turned their ship into a writhing, viney mess and then transformed them into dolphins? Yeah, I mean, he's done a lot. But by and large, his overarching story often makes it sound simple, just cut and dry, a kind of straightforward story of one god with one personality and one history. But obviously you all well know by this point, because you're listening to my over-the-top self, that that is so incredibly far from the truth 
And that's what makes Dionysus and Greek mythology so damn interesting. What we're really talking about instead is a god who almost certainly originated in one of the ancient cultures to the east of Greece. They likely developed him as their own god long before the Greeks, before the Greeks adopted him and turned him into their own, while keeping this association with the east and then developing a story around it. Because even the Greeks have made it clear that while they've given Dionysus an origin story in their heartland, Thebes, they've made him Greek, but they've also ensured that he's seen as a foreigner among the Greeks. They want him to be theirs, to be Greek as Greek can be, but they also want to retain the mystery that surrounds him as this foreign, eastern, almost barbarian god. See, if you're the ancient Greeks and you've just adopted this important eastern god in order to solidify him into your culture's pantheon of religion, you're going to need him to have these Greek origins. So he becomes Theban, a child of Zeus, but a traveler. The connection to Thebes and the house of Cadmus, because Dionysus is Cadmus's grandson, is vital too. Cadmus is also a transplant from the East who became an iconically Greek hero. So they reflected something similar with Dionysus. And then, of course, add to that that his grandmother is Harmonia, like a daughter of two Olympians. None of this is a coincidence. Honestly, I'm kind of convinced that Thebes is like the secret hidden away heart of all of Greek mythology. They've just been overshadowed by Athens and its propaganda machine. Of course, I could devote like an entire series of podcast episodes to breaking down all the different bits and pieces of Dionysus, but I won't. So we're going to have to settle for peppering in episodes on him just now and then. The man, or perhaps the person, is more appropriate. Uh, he contains multitudes. Just like his father Zeus, Dionysus has a whole host of possibilities when it comes to the story of where exactly he was raised. There are so many mountains in Greece where you can find stories of Zeus being raised while he was, you know, hidden away from the hungry belly of his father. And Dionysus is just the same. Only, well, he was being hidden from Hera. The most commonly understood place for Dionysus spending his childhood was Mount Kithiron in Boeotia. See, when he was born from Zeus's thigh in an impressive feat of uterine erasure, Dionysus was brought to a mountain, or even a region that they just call Nyssa, where he was raised by nymphs, who are also often called just Nyssaean. But, well, where exactly this Nyssa was is hotly debated by the ancient Greeks. It's ambiguous enough that it could be anywhere, and with that comes many different police grabbing hold of the story. So again, the most commonly used mountain of for Nyssa is Kithiron, because, you know, Dionysus was conceived in Thebes, he has major Theban ancestry, so the nearby mountain just makes the most logical sense. You know, there he would have been raised not necessarily by these nymphs, but by his aunts, I know Agawe and Atanui, the sisters of Semele and the daughters of Cadmus and Harmonia. And there, he was also mentored by a satyr named Silenus, who eventually gains quite a bit of fame himself. Honestly, I need to do an episode that's like just Dionysus and Silenus. It'll come eventually. But well, you know, this is Greek mythology, so logical sense then gets thrown out the window often in favor of having one's home polis connected with a god like Dionysus. So in addition to Mount Kithiron, the people of Euboea, modern Evia, say that Dionysus was actually raised on their island by a woman named Macris and a man named Aristias. And of course, the people of Naxos say that he was raised there. That's why it's sacred to him. There, he would have been raised by the nymphs called the Hyades, who eventually become a constellation. The island of Icaria, too, they say he was actually raised there. And the Spartans say that Dionysus and Semele, who was already dead at the time, washed up on their shores to be raised by Spartans. 
Whew. Or later, when we're dealing further with Dionysus's origins in the East, like a good, you know, many hundreds to a thousand years after his origins in ancient Greece, Mount Nyssa gets placed in places like Egypt or Arabia or even India. There's a very late tradition where Dionysus wandered all the way to India and throughout that whole region. Or, you know, if we're talking mountains, maybe he wasn't from quite so far east and instead he was raised in Phrygia by the Magna Mater herself, Cybele. In those late versions, he gets conflated with a Phrygian god called Sebasios. <laughs> the inclusion of India, though, in these later stories is like this great example of when the ancient world expands in the minds of the Greeks and others. You know, so do the stories of their deities expand. So when Dionysus was first being worshipped, they did not know that India existed. But after the time of Alexander the Great, and you know, when he reached it and created this connection between the two regions, the Greeks start to incorporate it into their mythology. And so of course their wandering Eastern god would have traveled to India. And I mean, these are Greeks and Romans we're talking about. So I don't think I have to tell you that, you know, in the story, Dionysus conquers the Indian people. Because, like, of course, they would have him doing that. You know, they got to prove that they're the best. The thing about a god like Dionysus is that he was just so popular, so widespread, and he only gained more importance as the years and centuries went on. So the stories of him vary wildly when they exist in detail at all. Instead of detail, usually what we have are just these little snippets, these moments in time. Like in the Iliad, we learn about a man named Lycorgus who tried to run Dionysus out of his home on Mount Nyssa, driving him and the nymphs who raised him into the sea where Dionysus finds refuge with Thetis. Lycurgus, of course, was punished by the Olympians, wounded by them, and hated by all the immortals until he died a sad death. No one fucks with the god of wine, even if he's still just a teenager. Or later sources say this happened when Dionysus was much older, when he was wandering through the east and bringing his gift of wine across the Mediterranean. In those cases, Lycurgus is this Thracian, and he's very impious, and he's determined to drive Dionysus from his lands. Again, Dionysus rushes to the sea to escape Lycurgus, and again he's found and cared for by Thetis. But in this case, his Mynads and followers, they're left behind, taken captive by Lycurgus. But not for long, of course, because Dionysus has them magically freed before causing Lycurgus to go mad to the point where he kills his own son, dismembering him with an axe. <laughs> this horrific act then causes his land to become barren, but then Apollo gives like an oracular prophecy that if Lycurgus were to die, the land would be fertile again. So his own people immediately take him up to a mountain, tie him there. And with Dionysus's help, they let him be killed by his own horses. And no, we don't get detail as to how exactly his horses killed him. But given he's Thracian and Heracles is famous for dealing with some man-eating Thracian horses, I mean, we can get an idea. Or... In a far more fantastical take on the story of Dionysus and Lycurgus, in another later source, Pseudohygienus, Lycurgus once again tries to get Dionysus to leave his land, but in the course of that this time, well, he gets drunk, and then he tries to assault his mother before he tries to cut down Dionysus's grapevines in response to his drunkenness, like bringing out the monster in him. He determines that wine affects the mind. But of course, when he tries to destroy Dionysus's vines, Dionysus actually affects his mind way more than wine ever could. And Lycurgus kills his own wife and son before Dionysus eventually throws him to his panthers. Oddly enough, after this little side note that, well, you know, like he got thrown to panthers, Hyginus adds just, quote, He is said to have cut off one foot, thinking it was a vine. So yeah, I mean, lots of things happening with this Lycurgus myth, and yet none of them are remotely detailed or fleshed out in stories. But what's most interesting, and why I told you all of that, is actually, surprise, surprise, um, what we don't have. 
We have this little anecdote in Homer that I told you about from the Iliad. The simple idea that Lycurgus angered Dionysus, drove him from his lands. And then like 800 to 1,000 years later, we have these stories from Pseudo Apollodorus and Pseudo Hyenas, the ones I just told. But somewhere in between, there was so much more that we don't know. Aeschylus wrote a play called The Edonians. That was about the story of Lycurgus and Dionysus. And he wrote another called The Bassarids, which is connected to this story along with the fate of Orpheus when he was killed by Dionysus' maenads. And he wrote The Youths, about young people worshipping Dionysus in Thrace, again connected with this Lycurgus myth. But not only was this a trilogy of plays written by Aeschylus, all about this myth that we have like a paragraph about, it was actually a full-on tetralogy, because even the satyr play that accompanied these three tragedies at the time was also about Lycurgus, and it was just called Lycurgus. So it's yet another instance of just the most fascinating and frustrating aspect of Greek mythology and, like, storytelling from the ancient world. The things we know that we don't know. Like, clearly there was enough content in this myth for Aeschylus to write four entire plays about it that are all lost. (laughs) And yet, we've got a sentence in Homer and a couple of short paragraphs from, like, 800 years later, Roman period authors. (sighs) Dionysus simultaneously, you know, somehow manages to have an enormous volume of content about him, and yet so little, all at the same time. So I originally planned this episode to talk about the loves of Dionysus. You know, all the gods have them. They're always this epically long list of women and men that they've loved and lost. Of course, by that I mean love in enormous quotation marks because gods only know how many of them actually loved the person they were with, let alone how the other person felt about the situation. Still, you know, this is common across the board. It's often an effort to like tie these gods to specific regions and characters. And so we've already learned via, you know, the story of how Dionysus was raised, that he's a god that so many regions wanted to link themselves to. So one can only imagine how many lovers a god like him might have. Except, (laughs) well, Dionysus manages to not fit that stereotype at all, despite the fact that Even I fully expected to find a long list of lovers and problematic ones at that. Instead, from what I've been able to figure out, all the lovers of Dionysus, aside from his wife, Ariadne, come from very, very late sources. Mostly one source who I've mentioned many times before in the podcast. But we'll get to him. What's important now is that when it comes to sources beyond like the Orphic tradition, which, you know, gods know I won't touch unless forced... And before the Roman period, we basically just have one lover of Dionysus. Just one. And that's Ariadne. And gods, did Dionysus love Ariadne? There are a few different versions of how Dionysus and Ariadne got together, if they did get together. Sometimes she's killed on Naxos before she can ever meet Dionysus. And there's even one source that suggests that actually he was the aggressor and not Theseus. But like, I mean, what are the chances? Plus, that's no fun and it gives Ariadne only a Thessalian tragedy. So I'm going to gloss right over those versions in favor of the better and more common version that she ends up happily married to Dionysus. And this is the more common and even ancient version to the point where even in Hesiod's Theogony, He explains that Dionysus marries Ariadne, and because of that, she's turned into a goddess and made immortal. Though, (laughs) if I'm being entirely honest with you, she's also mentioned in the Odyssey as having been killed by Artemis on Naxos before she could even, like, have sex with Theseus. (laughs) 
But given Theseus basically didn't exist as a hero when the tradition of Homer was at its peak, I'm just going to go ahead and assume that this was added later by the Athenians in their ongoing attempt to retcon Theseus into the Homeric tradition. Dionysus and Ariadne, as a happily married couple, are depicted on art together on pottery like many, many times. And even in the Euripides play The Hippolytus, which features Ariadne's sister Phaedra, who is then married to Theseus. And even in that, though, Phaedra talks about how her sister married a god. But the actual story of them meeting, falling in love, getting married doesn't really exist in any detail, at least in early Greek sources. Instead, we just know that it happened. (laughs) I want to tell you a big, long love story. It just doesn't exist. But Ariadne, as the primary, if not the only lover of Dionysus, appears to be like a very common tradition until the Roman period. And not only that, but from my experience, they're one of the few divine couples that are described as like being not only legitimately in love, but also legitimately happy together just like content (laughs) there's a line in the argonautica you know from the third century bce so it is later where the narrator is speaking of a robe that hypsipyle gives to jason on his journey and quote it was a work of art a joy forever as pleasing to the eyes as to the senses of touch and it still gave out the ambrosial perfume it received when the lord dionysus lay on it tipsy with wine and nectar, embracing Minos's daughter, the fair young Ariadne, whom Theseus carried off from Knossos and abandoned on the isle of Naxos. <sighs> it's just cute. <laughs> and Ariadne and Dionysus being happily in love isn't always at the expense of Theseus either. Obviously, I love hearing bad things said about Theseus, but it's important that the couple can be happily married even without Theseus having explicitly abandoned her. It means that the tradition was accepted even where Theseus was still the good guy. Like in this line from the historian Diodorus Siculus from the first century BCE, he says, quote, Theseus carried off Ariadne from Crete and sailed out unobserved during the night, after which he put at the island, which at the time was called Dia, but is now called Naxos. At this same time, the myths relate, Dionysus showed himself on the island, and because of the beauty of Ariadne, he took the maiden away from Theseus and kept her as his lawful wife, loving her exceedingly. Indeed, after her death, he considered her worthy of immortal honors because of the affection he had for her, and placed among the stars of heaven the crown of Ariadne. It's just lovely and cute! But for all Dionysus loved his wife Ariadne, there is a later tradition where, well, he doesn't necessarily love Ariadne any less, but suddenly we have many stories of many other lovers. And most of that comes from none other than Nonus, that 4th century CE writer of the longest surviving Greek epic, the Dionysiaca, about Dionysus. Now, I can't touch any of those stories today because, well, Nonus was a seriously wordy man and that epic is 48 books long. Even just, like, word count aside, that's double the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey. There are only 24 books. One day. One day we'll get there. It's the longest surviving epic for a reason. Still, there is at least one lover of Dionysus that is not Ariadne. Still very late, but not found in Nonus. And, well, if I'm honest, honestly, reading this very brief story is why this episode exists. It's just that it's, you know, it's quite short and thus uh, turned into this more general exploration of everyone's favorite god of wine. See, there's this story of Dionysus from pseudo Hyginus, So, you know, very late into the Roman period, always frustratingly brief, but... 
it's too good to pass up. And to me, it just truly signifies Dionysus as a character. You know, where Zeus will take whatever he wants, no matter what. Where Poseidon will get violent and terrifying. Where Apollo will inadvertently cause his lover's death. Well, Dionysus does this instead. In Caledon, that region famous for its boar, Dionysus met a man named Aeneas. Just like Heracles, Dionysus traveled all over the place, giving countless regions reason to have stories associated with him. His travels, though, were often explicitly to not only spread, you know, the word about worshipping Dionysus, because it's fun, uh, but it was also about spreading the concept of growing grapes and turning them into wine. So during these travels, though very early, for reasons you're about to find out, in Caledon, Dionysus met Aeneas and his wife, Althea. Their story is basically told only in pseudo hyenas, which means, again, it's brief and to the point, but fortunately, the point is fucking entertaining. You see, Dionysus met this happy couple, and they welcomed him into their home as their guest. A bit of that, you know, Xenia tradition that I spoke to Lauren Ginsburg about in the most recent conversation episode. Xenia is all about keeping guests happy and guests keeping their hosts happy. It's symbiotic, very important mythologically. Now, with most of the stories of gods, you know, something's going to go wrong. Someone's going to tear apart the tradition of Xenia and they will end up in dire need of punishment, you know, Tantalus style. Or at the very least, some god's going to quote unquote seduce a woman and, you know, get her into trouble. That's how these things always go, right? Not this time. Nope. Aeneas and Althea take Dionysus in as their guest and, well, you know, Althea catches the eye of Dionysus. Ooh, she's pretty. And he decides that he'd like to have sex with her. But of course, only if it's all right with Althea and her husband. <laughs> He's not his father after all. Althea and Aeneas appear to find this to be a very desirable experience. Aeneas just waves goodbye to his wife and the god of wine and madness. You know, maybe wishes them to have a good time in his home. And then off he goes to pretend that he, you know, needs to be performing some sacred rite or other. Really, he's just giving them time alone together. And Dionysus repays the couple handsomely. He's so appreciative that not only was he able to have a nice sexy time with this nice lady, but her husband just, you know, went on his merry way, killed a bit of time, you know, allow them to do the deed. And so when they're finished and Aeneas returns to his wife and the god, you know, who we can imagine with or without clothing at this point, who's to say, Everyone is still perfectly content with what went down. Dionysus just gifts Aeneas with the grapevine, along with all the information that he would need to get a nice vineyard up and running as a thank you. Dionysus tells him how to plant the vines, how to harvest, all of it. And then he tells Aeneas that the resulting fruit and wine should be called Enos, in honor of Aeneas's great hosting skills. Hosting skills, which... Yes, we're basically just, like, being chill with the fact that his wife is going to fuck a god. And thus, Dionysus grants the very concept of wine as a gift to Aeneas. And this is the introduction of wine to Greece, mythologically. All because he got to have a bit of fun sex with the man's wife. Because Enos is the word for wine, even to this day. <laughs> and of course, Althea was pregnant by Dionysus, because always. And according to at least Pseudopolidorus and Hyenus, their daughter was none other than Dianera, the woman who would go on to become Heracles' last wife and the accidental cause of his death. Which, you know, was a bit unsurprising, given her name means destroyer of man. And well, if it's not obvious, uh, I love that story very much. It's it's so refreshing to find a story where you can pretty safely understand that the sex between a mortal and a god was consensual and even like appreciated, let alone worthy of the gift of wine. This story is only told, like I said, in one little paragraph by Pseudo Hyenus, a Roman, you know, from the second century CE. So it's difficult to say if it was older than that, but the Greeks certainly did understand Dionysus to have introduced them to wine via this man, Aeneas. 
it's still this little paragraph is just so straight and to the point in its wonderful absurdity that I just need to share it with you. Quote, when Dionysus had come as a guest to Aeneas, son of Partheon, he fell in love with Althea, daughter of Thestius and wife to Aeneas. When Aeneas realized this, he voluntarily left the city and pretended to be performing sacred rites. But Dionysus lay with Althea, who became mother of Dianera. To Aeneas, because of his generous hospitality, he gave the vine as a gift and showed him how to plant it and decreed that its fruit should be called Enos, from the name of his host. Like, Dionysus, honestly, what a guy. But now for all it seems that Dionysus is lacking in extracurricular lovers, you know, when it comes to ancient sources, there are definitely a fair few that come later in Nonus. There's Ampelus, of course, whose story I've told before. It does appear in another source, but it's in detail in Nonus. He was a young man that Dionysus fell for and fell hard. Tragic end, of course. And there are a handful of women and men that appear as his lovers in that mad epic, the Dionysiaca. Which again, one day we will dive into, but today is not that day because it's so fucking long. But I simply cannot talk about Dionysus without telling you one particular anecdote. Because, well, like, it's again very late and very odd, but it is one of my favorite moments from myth, like, ever. The best part, though, is I'm just going to read a quote of it. Because this comes from an early Christian writer, Clement of Alexandria, from around the 2nd century CE. And well, like, this is the quote I need to read, because again, this is a Christian. Explicitly, the, the context is he's explicitly criticizing the Greeks for their paganism, you know, for the gods that they worship. Particularly, well... Christians have always known how to Christian. So this guy is mad about a dick. Quote, Phalloi are consecrated to Dionysus. This is the origin of these Phalloi. Dionysus was anxious to descend into Hades, but he did not know the way. Thereupon a certain man, Prosimnos by name, promises to tell him, though not without a reward. The reward was not a seemly one, though to Dionysus it was seemly enough. It was a favor of lust, this reward which Dionysus was asked for. The god is willing to grant the request, and so he promises, in the event of his return, to fulfill the wish of Prosimnos, confirming the promise with an oath. Having learned the way, he set out and came back again. He does not find Prosimnos, for he was dead. In fulfillment of the vow to his lover, Dionysus hastens to the tomb and indulges his unnatural lust. Cutting off a branch from a fig tree which was at hand, he shaped it into the likeness of a phallus, and then made a show of fulfilling his promise to the dead man. As a mystic memorial of this passion, phalloi are set up to Dionysus in cities, For if it were not to Dionysus that they held solemn procession and sang the phallic hymn, they would be acting most shamefully. Oh, Dionysus, he does love dicks. Now, I've told that story before, where Dionysus needs instructions to get to the underworld. This guy says he'll tell him if he fucks him. Dionysus is like, great. If you get me there, I'll fuck you on the way back. But then he's dead. So Dionysus just makes a dildo and fucks that instead. But hearing it in the words of an angry Christian, just, well, it made my day. Uh, Today's episode is, it's a lot, but Dionysus, he just, he does love dicks. Thank you so much for listening, as always. Sometimes I just want to talk about a particular god, and I've exhausted the really detailed stories, so I'm just like, I want to tell you guys everything. And that everything often means these, like, kind of 
piecemeal episodes where I just stick a bunch of interesting stuff into a narrative. And I know, you know, it's not quite as exciting as these longer narratives, but it's necessary because it's kind of all we have and Dionysus is worth it. But I just... Those two stories at the end are just, you know, they're the reason he's the best. So thank you all so much for listening as always. I just got it's it's so much fun to dive, you know, into the depths of some of these characters. Obviously, Dionysus is a favorite because he's just he's so fun and cool, you know. Anyway, we all love Dionysus and it's worth it if we get to hear an angry Christian be mad about all of the dicks didn't know this episode would have so many dicks. I'm not sorry about it. And so today I will leave you with a lovely five-star review from one of you amazing listeners that you leave on Apple Podcasts because you're the best. This one comes from a user called Lorelei Firebeer in the States. Live is easy to listen to. I personally need podcasts to be fun and conversational because I have a very short attention span. This one fits the bill and is also so informative and Liv tells stories with a lot of passion. If you struggle to learn about Greek mythology through other mediums, this is your chance. It's like having a friend explain it to you. Thank you. And thank you all for all your reviews. Honestly, they they mean the whole world to me and um, they help the show immensely. So please keep them up and I'll keep reading them. Let's Talk About Bits Baby is written and produced by me, Liv Albert. Sometimes she's good at writing scripts and sometimes she's fine, but there's a lot of dicks. Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians. Also the assistant producer. The podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. Listen on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Help me continue bringing you the world of Greek mythology and the ancient Mediterranean by becoming a patron. We get bonus episodes and more. Visit patreon.com slash mythsbaby or click the link in this episode's description. I am Liv and I... I love this shit. Particularly, I just, I love the story of Prosimnos so much. Mm-hmm.